welcome and thank you for coming today to our Sight and Sound Buds webinar. This is a, a webinar series brought to you by the Ioneer Foundation. My name is Craig Smith and I'm a development officer with the foundation. This bi-weekly series highlights research in the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And the research that we support is only possible thanks to generous philanthropic support. So we wanna thank everybody who has supported our mission in the past. I wanna go over a few housekeeping things for today. Uh, for these webinars, we do disable the chat function. So you won't be able to chat during the program. However, you can submit questions at any time throughout the program using the Q&A feature. And after our presenters are done presenting, we will have uh, 15 or 20 minutes to do a Q&A session with them live. So please feel free to submit your questions throughout the entire hour. Um, we do ask that you refrain from asking very personal medical questions that might not be um, might not be relevant to the larger audience. However, if you'd like to email those to me at my email address is craig at ear.org. I'd be happy to pass them along to Dr. Kamyar and Dr. Finkelstein for them to address offline. We've also enabled caption captioning for this program, so please feel free to use subtitles throughout the program if you'd like. And we're recording this webinar as well, and we, like all of our webinars, will add this to our website after the fact. So this will be available on our website at www.iandear.org probably by the end of the week or early next week. And additionally, everybody who's attending today will be added to our mailing list if you aren't already. So you'll be getting future webinar invitations, blog posts, newsletters, and things of that such to keep up on all the research in both departments that we'll be featuring. Excited about today's presentation. Uh, today's presentation is entitled Advancements in Cataract Surgery. And I'm joined by two of our esteemed faculty members, Dr. Jerome Finkelstein and Dr. Hirohina Kamyar. Uh, Dr. Finkelstein is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Ophthalmology. He currently serves as vice chair for clinical operations, chief of ophthalmology at UPMC Oakland and UPMC Mercy, and the physician lead for the department's ophthalmic technician training program. Dr. Kamyar is a clinical assistant professor of ophthalmology in the Department of Ophthalmology. She specializes in cornea and external diseases. She also currently serves on the advisory board for the Center for Organ Recovery and Education, which is our region's organ procurement organization. And she's also the assistant medical director for the region's eye bank. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Finkelstein at this time. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today's topic is advancements in cataract surgery. So we'll start with the basics. What is a cataract? Well, a cataract is your eye's natural lens, focusing lens that's gone cloudy. As you age, it'll, it will increase in thickness and also become a bit cloudy where it was once clear. And it may get to a point where it starts to affect your vision. And you notice that as blurry vision or some glare. Um, it's a very common process. We all will at some point in our lives develop some change to our lens, um, probably not all of us enough to need surgery, but um, it is part of the normal aging process. Most of us that are 55 and, and above are going to have some form of cataract, even if it's not symptomatic to them. So how, why, why do you, what other things I should say cause cataracts other than just aging? We've talked about that already. And, but there are other things that can cause you to get cataracts um, earlier in life. Uh, if you're a diabetic, particularly if, you're, if you have had uh, poor control of your sugars or have just had diabetes for many years, you're more likely to develop a cataract. Smoking is a huge risk factor. Um, any surgery or trauma to your eye can cause development of a cataract. And ultraviolet light, in particular is, is known to cause cataracts. So spending a lot of time in the sun or in tanning beds without protection uh, can lead to cataracts much younger than, than you would ordinarily. Certain medications may cause this, um, in particular steroids, oral, oral in particular, or certain eye drops that contain steroids. If you're on them for a long period of time, you can develop cataracts from that too. If you have a cataract, what might you expect? Well, 
the main one would be blurry vision. You can imagine that it's, it's like having, you know, kind of a little film of Vaseline or grease over your, over your glasses, kind of a feel. You just feel like nothing is clear. Um, you may have some fading out of, of colors. This is a, I believe, Rohini, you could stop me if I'm wrong. This is impressionist paintings that are uh, showing what may happen as you develop a cataract. You can get certain painters. I, I think Van Gogh is one of them. This may be um, oh, Monet. 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 <laughs> Monet, yeah. But they, as they got older in life, their, their perception of colors changed and it was reflected in their paintings. And you can see that they have, you know, more muddied colors as they got older to the picture on the right. Um, you may develop halos around light or glare. A lot of early symptoms of cataracts are people not feeling comfortable driving at night because of the oncoming headlights from other cars or street lights that give them a lot of glare and halos. In general, just seeing at night may be difficult. You may need much more light to see anything at all. What can I do? How, how can you stop this? Well, certainly a simple answer is to wear sunglasses with ultraviolet protection. Nowadays, almost everything on the rack has 100% ultraviolet A and B protection. And it's usually stated on somewhere inside the the, the frame, but um, that's a simple solution when you're outdoors in the sun and particularly in the summer months. Here in Pittsburgh, I'd say probably from April through to, to October is in the winter months, it's, it's certainly less, less concerning because of the angle of the sun. Um, certainly stopping smoking, which we all know is, is a terrible thing. Um, you can get benefit from this even if you've smoked for many years. It's still of value to stop now if you're still smoking. If you're diabetic, keep your sugars in good control. Um, people often ask, is there some magic, magic pill or bullet or in this case a drop that can, can dissolve cataracts? And the answer is no. There, there's nothing that we know of that can stop or reverse the progression of cataracts. If you think you might have a cataract, what do you do? Well, you get an eye exam. And it can also make sure that you don't have anything else that could be a reason for your visual symptoms. Um, as part of the eye exam, you'll get what's known as a refraction, which is a measurement of your eye prescription. And that may be the reason that you just have an out-of-date eyeglass prescription and new glasses fixes this. If you're told you have a cataract, what could you do? Well, you can have it removed, but when should you have it removed? I, I think if you're not bothered by it and it doesn't affect what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you're just noticing that things aren't how they used to be, you don't have to do anything about it. And you can follow with your ophthalmologist or optometrist if they're following you and just talk to them about how far along the cataract is. They can give you feedback as to, as to that and then also as to how your vision's doing. And, you know, when it becomes challenging to do the things you want to do you can't you don't want to drive at night you don't want to drive you don't you know you can't read small print anymore you're not happy reading books anymore and that's probably the time to have surgery i'm just going to go back well we're going to go back actually this will be a long time ago but a few hundred years ago at least when cataracts were removed in a very different fashion than today. So the patient would see the doctor who probably wasn't a specialist at that point and said, doctor, I can't see well. And the doctor looks at him and decides you have a cataract. So come on with me. And the patient understandably is worried that this might be a painful thing. And the doctor reassures him, maybe falsely, that uh, this won't hurt a bit, so have a seat. Back then, what they would do is basically hold you down 
and it usually took more than one person and there was no anesthesia back then and they would do a technique known as couching this was actually done even you know it's been documented even thousands of years ago but it was certainly done in the middle ages um, for, for very dense cataracts. And back then you could imagine if someone developed a cataract, the only reason to do something like this is if that cataract was you know, almost complete or mature as we say, so that you couldn't barely see anything, then it was worth doing a, a, a kind of a brutal procedure like this, where, where what they would do is stick a needle into the eye and then remove the cataract by pushing it and tearing it off its, its mooring, so to speak, and pushing it out of the way. So in the first image, you can see there's your, your normal lens. In the second image, there's this, this uh, tool that kind of dislodges part of the cataract supports and push downward. Oops, sorry, went backwards. And then here you see the lens just kind of laying to the side so that now there's at least a clear view to the back of the eye. You know, it was a very rough procedure. And as you can imagine, there was a lot of bleeding, infections were common, and very poor vision was common. But it was certainly something that if it was successful, allowed you to see a bit better than you could before, maybe seeing light and dark beforehand and then going to at least seeing you know the shapes of people and the shapes of doorways and being able to kind of walk through doorways and navigate by yourself but it was really quite uh not nice in 1752 a french ophthalmologist jacques davier he presented a paper that was his idea to take the lens out of the eye and he's credited as sort of the father of modern cataract surgery. He came up with the idea that you can remove the lens and it would cause less inflammation, less chance of infection. And it was, it was the way cataracts were done, certainly in Europe for, for a couple hundred years. The problem with this, of course, was that you still were left without any lens in your eye. So your focusing was very, very blurry. And back then there wasn't much in the way of glasses and it was better than not having your cataract removed if it was that bad, but it still was, was not much um, better than, you know, than, than kind of shapes and, and the big E on the chart, so to speak. Fast forward into World War II, we're actually prior to World War II, um, there was a British flight surgeon named Dr. Harold Ridley, and he was a, 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 on staff at Moorfields Hospital in London. And he was doing surgery, eye surgery, on the uh, Hurricane and Spitfire pilots, the British pilots that were injured um, you know, in, in dogfights during in World War II. Prior to World War II, just to, to give you the background, the, the fighter planes that were in World War I all had glass canopies, the original fighter planes. Perspex, the company, was, was a company that developed one of the first plastics. It was called polymethyl methacrylate. And one of the applications for this plastics was for the canopies of the fighter planes. So there was now a new generation of fighter planes that were developed for World War II. And these were the Hurricanes and the Spitfires that are... These planes were lighter and faster and more maneuverable. And as you know, were used extensively during the war, but it, it, it resulted in a lot of injuries. And some of those injuries were from shards of the plastic um, embedding in, into the pilots into their body, but in particular for this talk, into their eyes. And what Ridley noticed was that these pieces didn't react. They sat there in their eyes, but they didn't cause inflammation and they didn't really cause any clouding of the tissues around it. 
And he thought, wow, that would be a great idea to use this material as an implant to put in there to take the place of their natural lens when we do cataract surgery. And it was, it, well, let me, before I go to the next slide, it was because of him that, that implants became possible. Um, through the 50s and 60s, uh, Ridley and lots of his colleagues, uh, both first in, in, in Britain and other parts of Europe and then into the United States, developed ver uh, various types of implants. Um, some were meant to go behind the iris, some were meant to go in front of the iris, some were clipped to the iris. There were various designs. His very first design was extremely heavy. He thought he would just replace the natural lens with this Perspex material that um, filled the entire um, area that the old lens took up, but it was 20 times as heavy as, as, as your natural lens and it couldn't support it. And it took many, many years and iterations to figure out that they needed something very thin and very lightweight that could go into your eye and sit there. But he was the first one and he made it possible for us to have what we have today. We're gonna fast forward. So for, for through the 60s and 70s, and into the early 80s, cataract surgery was done by making a large incision, removing the lens, and then putting this polymethyl methacrylate or perspex material into the eye. In the early 60s, actually, I think it was the mid 60s, a New York City ophthalmologist named Charlie Kelman was sitting in his dentist chair and asked the dentist, what is that thing you're using on my teeth? And it was an ultrasound machine and it was used to clean the enamel. What was, a, what was remarkable to Dr. Kelman was that that ultrasound tip didn't damage the enamel. It was able to remove the plaque without damaging the structure that was right below it. And he thought, wow, that could be something we may be able to use to kind of break up the cataract, but not damage the, because it doesn't, not damage the structures around it because it doesn't, really disturb things that are more than a, you know, a fraction of, of, of a millimeter away from it. And he invented a machine in, in, in the late 60s that was the first machine that used ultrasound to remove the cataract. And thus the, the era of phaco emulsification was born. It would take a, a decade and a half before it really started to take off. And was, was in, I think computers and software technology really aided this to become what it is today, which is the modern standard for cataract surgery. Faco emulsification, phaco means lens, emulsification is to soften. And the idea was that this tool would, would soften or, or break down the, the, the uh, components of your cataract, of your natural lens, and then you could remove it from the inside out. There, the, the, the design of this machine is such that the tip that goes inside your eye to remove it also has a suction and also has fluid so that as you're breaking this into little pieces, it's immediately suctioned out of your eye and you don't have to make a large incision anymore. It allowed us to use much smaller incisions. It allowed the surgery to be faster and more stable. It allowed the recovery to be quicker and more predictable. What it turned out is that the type of lens we use was now becoming the limiting factor. The methyl, polymethyl methacrylate lenses were, were a stiff plastic and they had to be well, approximately about six millimeters in size to, to cover your pupil. So the phaco emulsification or ultrasound tip could be as small as three millimeters or even smaller but the implants were double that size. So they still had to make incisions that were at least six millimeters until the race was on to find more flexible materials that could fold up and go inside a very small wound. And by the late eighties, early nineties, they found materials, first silicone and then um, a other types of uh, flexible acrylates were um, used with good memory, meaning that you could fold them up and then they'd open back up to exactly what they were when they were unfold, you know, unfolded before. 
And then they could put these materials inside the eye through the same wound that the, the, ultra, the uh, ultrasound tip went through. And that now allows us to use incision sizes that are very small, approximately a tenth of an inch or even smaller. So I think at this stage, I, I can turn this over to Dr. Kamyar and she can tell us about cataract surgery and how it's done today and what options we have. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about cataract surgery. Um, so this is usually an outpatient procedure. Um, we do this surgery under light IV sedation. So we call it a twilight sedation. Um, we don't make you completely asleep for the surgery, but we want to make sure that you're not feeling anxious. You won't see any instruments coming at you or anything like that. Um, we make a very small incision um, and through that incision, um, we are going to create an opening in the capsule that contains the cataract. So the capsule is a shell that um, contains the cataract that we want to leave intact because that's where your new lens implant will go. And so here, um, again, you see the ultrasound probe removing the cataract and then the lens implant being inserted into the eye. So femtosecond laser cystic cataract surgery is a newer development in cataract surgery. Um, the laser is used to start the procedure. So it creates the incision, it creates an opening in the lens capsule, and it also um, can soften the cataract. However, the rest of the surgery is conducted in the same way. So the ultrasound probe is still used um, to remove the cataract and then the lens implant is put into its place. So a lot of um, my patients will ask, so what's the benefits or you know, pros and cons of you know, the traditional way that we do the cataract surgery, which we consider the gold standard versus a laser? The benefits of traditional cataract surgery, it's actually faster um, because we're using one single machine and microscope versus a laser. There's um, two machines involved. Um, there can be less inflammation. Um, sometimes the laser can create a little inflammation in the cornea. Um, and there's no additional cost to the patient, so there's no out-of-pocket fee. Um, and it can be more comfortable for the patient too because with the laser, there is a large suction device that's place in the eye that can put a lot of pressure, um, which can sometimes be uncomfortable. The downsides of traditional cataract surgery, there's certain types of cataracts that are more challenging to remove in general. And in, in those situations, the laser, laser can actually be really helpful. And those types of cataracts are very dense ones, um, ones that have um, are related to uh, trauma and also if there's a cloudy cornea, if we have trouble seeing into the eye to be able to take out the cataract, uh, sometimes the laser can be really helpful for that. The downsides, again, is just the out-of-pocket costs, um, you know, a little bit slower, and there can be more inflammation. Um, this inflammation in corneal swelling usually resolves um, after about a month once the eye is completely healed from the cataract surgery. So there's been multiple trials that have looked at traditional cataract surgery versus laser cataract surgery. And really there has not been any significant difference in outcomes. So both methods are really good in terms of um, achieving great vision, um, patient reported health and safety outcomes are excellent with both methods. So a person's outcome really in large part de depends on the skill and experience of the surgeon. So if laser cataract surgery is something that you're interested in, I, I would definitely recommend having a discussion with your surgeon. Um, it is something that um, is offered at, the, at our new VI Institute. So now I'm going to be talking about um, intraocular lens implants. There's generally four categories of lenses, so we'll talk a little bit in depth about each of them. The monofocal lens um, is a lens that is the most common type used during cataract surgery. So most of our patients opt for the monofocal lens. It offers excellent optics. It has a single focus that can be set um, at either distance or intermediate range, which I consider like uh, good enough for computers or hobbies, you know, like for woodworking, things like that or near, which would I consider that reading a novel, you know, being able to read a newspaper. 
uh, most people choose to have good distance vision and wear reading glasses, usually over the counter glasses can suffice either for reading or computers. Someone that has been nearsighted their whole life, if they have always been able to read without their glasses and they really enjoy being nearsighted, um, those patients will sometimes actually choose to stay nearsighted and continue to wear their glasses for distance. Um, monofocal lenses can also be used to provide monovision. This is where one lens is um, um, set for distance and the other um, is set for either intermediate or near. So this is not for everybody. Um, it's usually the patients that do best with this are those that have naturally had monovision or have done it in contact lenses. Um, for someone that has never tried monovision, sometimes people will have trouble with their depth perception, especially if the difference between the two eyes is too large. Um, if it's something that you have never tried before, but you're really interested in this option, doing a contact lens trial before your cataract surgery can be really helpful to see if you can tolerate having that difference between the two eyes. And one thing that's also important, even with monovision, you'll still probably need glasses in certain cases. So usually it's when um, you're driving at night that your nearsighted eye can give you a little bit of glare. And then also, um, especially if we've set one for intermediate and the other for distance, you'll still need the glasses for reading. And then our next category of lenses are multifocal lenses. So these lenses, as you can see, have uh, multiple rings. Um, and these uh, lenses are designed to provide both distance and near vision. Uh, the different zones are set at different powers in these lenses. Another very similar type of lens is called an extended depth of focus lens. So as you can see, it looks similar with um, having these multiple rings. However, instead of multiple focal points, there's a single elongated focal point to enhance range of vision or depth of focus. These lenses are um, better at providing distance and intermediate vision, um, not so much with the near vision. Um, and the reason that some people prefer this lens over the multifocals is sometimes the glare and halos, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, are a little bit less with these lenses. So the benefits of multifocal and EDOF lenses are that there is less dependence on glasses after surgery. I think it's also important though to tell you that it doesn't completely eliminate the need for glasses for some patients. So there was um, a study that looked at multiple trials of multifocal and EDOF lenses that showed that 20% um, of patients still needed glasses for distance and 30% still needed glasses for near. So it still greatly reduced the need for them, but the, the need for glasses can still be there in certain situations. So this is the major con. This lens, um, this picture shows you the type of glare that you can get with these specialty lenses. So this is um, the first um, a halo here is what you might see with a multifocal lens. And um, this other um, halo is what you'd see more with the EDOF lenses. So this is mostly noticeable at nighttime. Um, in a lot of patients, this is not enough to necessarily prevent them from driving at night or feeling uncomfortable driving, but there definitely is a subset of patients that say that this is um, makes, makes them very uncomfortable driving at night. Um, so if night vision is very important to you, um, being able to drive at night, then um, usually we'd steer you away from these types of lenses. You can also have decreased contrast sensitivity with these lenses. Um, what that means is if you were, for example, to read a light gray type on a white background, it might be hard to differentiate the letters and numbers um, with these types of lenses versus a monofocal lens. Um, another important point is um, dry eyes. Is, it's so common to have dry eyes, but that can degrade the quality of vision. Um, so a lot of these patients will say that their vision is intermittently blurry, they have to blink their eyes a couple times to really get it to become in focus. 
Um, it, the vision also can be affected by other eye conditions such as glaucoma, if you've had a history of a retinal detachment, macular degeneration. So usually in um, our patients that have any of these conditions, we steer you away from these specialty lenses. The next category of lenses um, are called toric lenses. Um, these lenses correct for astigmatism. Um, so you may ask, what is astigmatism? Astigmatism is a very common condition where instead of your cornea being shaped round or spherical like a basketball, it's elongated more like a football. Um, this is correctable with glasses. However, if someone says um, they want to have a correction for this, so that would, with a monofocal lens, help them to see distance better without glasses, um, this is a, a great option for them. Um, it also can um, be used in either a multifocal or EDOF option too. So how is the lens implant power determined? So one thing that's very important is this is not an exact science. Um, measurements are taken to determine the length of the eye and the shape of the cornea. This is usually done um, during a preoperative visit when you come in to see us in clinic. Um, we use very advanced formulas that uh, estimate the power of the implant that is used for each eye. Um, these formulas are very accurate, but they're not 100% perfect. Um, and there is a possibility of over and under correction, um, where either you end up a little bit nearsighted or a little bit farsighted. This happens more often in eyes that are really nearsighted or really farsighted before surgery. And also in eyes that have undergone previous refractive surgery, such as LASIK or PRK. So important final points about lens implants. The final outcome after your cataract surgery dep depends on how you heal and how the implant settles in your eye. Um, and no surgeon can guarantee what the final outcome will be. Um, the choice of lens implant is not the same for everybody. So what your um, what works for you might not be the same um, that will work for your family member or for a friend. Um, so it really depends on the person. And we can also you never guarantee that you're going to be glasses free, although we wish we could, but um, unfortunately it's very hard to um, achieve that for every patient. So I'm going to go over just a few common questions um, regarding cataract surgery. So um, one is, what is dropless cataract surgery? Because there's a lot advertised about that. So traditionally, we use an antibiotic and steroid eye drop after surgery. Um, in dropless cataract surgery, the antibiotic and steroid is injected into the eye at the end of surgery. Um, the benefits, obviously, it's to not have to use eye drops after surgery, which um, would be wonderful. The downsides, um, there's no FDA approved antibiotic agent um, available that is um, indicated for injection into the eye. So these medications have to be compounded at a pharmacy. That, that introduces the possibility of toxicity. Um, and so for my patients, if someone is able to administer their own eye drops or they have a family member or friend that can easily do it, um, I usually, do it the traditional way and have them use their antibiotic and steroid drops after surgery. However, if someone is going to have difficulty um, getting the eye drops on a regular basis, then I think this is a great option for those patients. Um, another really common question is, what is the difference between LASIK and cataract surgery? Can I just have LASIK and forget the cataract surgery part? So LASIK is performed on a different part of the eye, on the cornea, which is the window to the eye, the very front layer of your eye. Um, and when we do LASIK surgery, we're re reshaping the cornea so that light can shine better onto the retina. It can be more in focus. So if you have a cataract where the lens is actually cloudy, no matter how you reshape the cornea, the vision is still going to be cloudy. Um, and so once your cataract starts developing, really the only option is cataract surgery. There are um, 
you know, potential risks with cataract surgery, thankfully these are extremely low. Um, complications happen at less than 5%. Some of the more serious ones, even more rare than that, but something to be informed about before you schedule your cataract surgery. Another really common question, will my cataract come back? So short answer is no. However, you can get this condition called posterior capsular opacification. This is really quite common. Um, some people call it a secondary cataract. It's where the capsule that contains the lens implant becomes cloudy. It usually happens anywhere from months to years after cataract surgery. Um, the great thing is really easy to treat. Um, it's, we perform this laser procedure in clinic. Um, it takes five or 10 minutes to do this um, laser. Um, it's really no downtime afterwards. The vision may be blurry for a few hours afterwards, but um, after that, the vision will be nice and clear as it was right after your cataract surgery. And the other nice thing about this is one-time procedure. So once you have it done, you really don't need it to be repeated again. So in summary, uh, cataracts are a normal age-related condition. Um, it's performed when your symptoms are affecting the quality of your vision and it's not correctable with glasses or contact lenses. And there are many different lens options. So the choice of lens can um, be different depending on the individual. Um, so it's important to have a discussion with your doctor. Um, you know, also talking about these new advances in technology, um, everything changes in ophthalmology um, quickly. So there's always new technologies to discuss. Um, and so talking to your surgeon will help you give, get a better and, and safe outcome for your surgery. We can open it up to questions now. Well, thank you both, Dr. Camyar and Dr. Finkelstein, for uh, that presentation and the history. Um, we do have <clears throat> quite a bit of questions. Please, audience, um, send in other questions that you'd like to uh, ask. If we don't get to all the questions uh, within the hour, we will answer the rest offline. But I'm going to dive right in. And I'm actually going to first start with a comment, and I appreciate the person um, who sent this in, uh, we have a comment that says, I think it's worth mentioning that Pittsburgh Eye and Ear under Dr. Murray McCaslin was on the forefront of Dr. Kelman's phago emulsification. A small group of Pittsburgh ophthalmologists were Charlie Kelman's first trainees in the mid 60s. Some went on to champion the procedure to the rest of the ophthalmic universe. Um, it's actually great timing that comment as well. Dr. Uh, Ronald Salvetti, who is an alumnus of our department and a member of the Eye and Ear Foundation board, um, he was one of these early trainees of Dr. Kelman, and he actually just gave a great presentation on the history of phaco emulsification during a recent alumni event uh, two weeks ago. So uh, Pittsburgh has definitely been on the forefront of this, uh, this type of technology. So I'm going to dive into the questions now. First question is, how is cataract surgery affected by having Fuchs dystrophy? I can take that one since um, I do cornea as well. So cataract surgery can definitely exacerbate Fuchs dystrophy. Um, so um, the inner layer of the cornea is lined by endothelial cells, which pump fluid in and out of the cornea. And with cataract surgery, you normally lose a small percentage of those cells. And um, when you have Fuchs dystrophy, you start with a lower number of those endothelial cells. Um, and so when you have cataract surgery and lose the normal, you know, small percentage of cells, it can have a greater effect on the vision. Um, and sometimes you can have persistent swelling in your cornea. Um, if the cor cornea's um, swelling resolves over time, usually people will do well and um, their vision will be clear. But if it doesn't, then um, there's um, a lot of great um, options in terms of corneal transplant surgery that can be done for Fuchs dystrophy. Next question is, have you ever had a patient who after surgery is so light sensitive that they must wear dark glasses inside and outside after a few months? I, I'll speak to that. Um, it, yes, I guess so. But typically, if, it, if you have a very dense cataract and have had it for a long time and it's suddenly removed, it can be like having worn dark sunglasses for many, many years, and then suddenly you're, you're walking around without them. So I have had patients that are light sensitive 
um, after their cataract surgery. Typically that does abate with time and they get more, their, their eyes and their brain get more and more used to their new vision. That, that's, it's, it's not as typical to just continue, continuous over years to have light sensitivity to that degree. Now there, I have had patients who over the years have told me that, yeah, I'm always a little more like light sensitive ever more since surgery. Um, at the bottom of that, you wrote after a few months, they're losing sight and th that shouldn't happen unless as Dr. Kamyar had described, you're developing a secondary cataract or you have another condition going on. Hey, thank you. Uh, is there a risk? And if so, what are the risks of somebody going a long time without getting their cataracts removed? Um, so generally there, there isn't too much risk with um, the cataracts over time because they develop so slowly. Um, However, when the cataracts become really, really dense, which again, it's pretty rare for it to get to that level, um, it does give you a, a higher risk of complications during the cataract surgery. Um, and, and this is something that um, your ophthalmologist sh should be able to tell you that, you know, your cataract is getting to a level that, you know, if you do decide to have surgery, the risks are going to be greater. It might be a better time, you know, to do it now versus, you know, waiting a few years. But but that situation is, is pretty rare. Uh, is there a difference in risk for cataracts based on gender? There, there is. There's a slight um, risk for women over men. Uh, I think the the statistics are maybe 60% women, I believe. And it's not felt to just be genetics. They don't, we, and I'm not sure it's very clear exactly what the reason is for that. So a similar question is, is there a hereditary risk for cataracts? In some, some patients, there are um, uh, congenital type cataracts, um, However, most of the time, the cataracts are, are just a normal, you know, age-related process. Um, you know, a lot of patients will say that my, both my parents had cataract surgery, but that, that's quite common scenario. Um, and so um, I would say the most common is age, but there are certain types of cataracts that can be genetic or inherited. Are there any challenges to cataract surgery if you previously had LASIK surgery? Yes, I mean, in general, it used, it used to be, and it still is to some degree, a little bit more difficult to predict the implant power after having had LASIK or any, any refractive surgery. Um, the formulas are just not uh, well designed for them. And there is just some inherent unpredictability in that. Um, but we're getting better, and uh, a lot of the newer formulas are, are get us much, much closer than we used to be. Um, anything else, Dr. Kamyar, that I might have missed on that? Yeah, no, I think that's great. I, I think also, you know, some patients worry that the cataract surgery will be more complicated. Um, but that's, you know, the, the surgery itself is um, fairly routine. It's, it's mainly just the lens implant choice, which is the issue with LASIK. Or PRK. So I'm sure every patient is a little different in this regard, but uh, the next question is, how long does it typically take before a patient is able to see clearly after their cataract surgery? So uh, most patients are seeing fairly well within, you know, a couple days, I would say, after their surgery. Um, sometimes um, if they have some swelling in the cornea, it can take a little bit longer. Um, I usually tell my patients that it can take up to a month for the vision to completely settle for the eye to be healed. Um, and it's pretty rare for it to be persistently blurry beyond that. There, there might be some other conditions in the eye that could um, make a patient more at risk for that. But um, I would say generally within a few days, and um, and it usually is a steady improvement over that period of time. How can you do cataract surgery prior to ERM surgery, which I'm hoping 
one of you two know what ERM surgery is. <laughs> sure. I, I, I'll uh, speak a little to that. So e ERM means epiretinal membrane which is a little film that can sometimes occur on the surface of the retina, in particular in, on the macula, which is where you have your finest vision. And um, you, you, we, nowadays we pretty much do cataract surgery prior to having any intervention uh, for, the, for an epiretinal membrane for a number of reasons. First of all, it's not clear if you have an epiretinal membrane that you'll have difficulty with your vision from that. And, but you might, um, if you have both, the, the thinking is you take the cataract out first, to see how well you're doing. And also um, it makes it easier for the retina surgeon to see if the decision is made later on to go in to get, to, to remove the epiretinal membrane. You now have a nice clear image through your implant. Next, I'm just, we have a, a, a nice comment. Somebody said, this has been a great help to me as I have to deal with cataracts in the future. Thank you. So um, nice that we are making an impact for people. So next question is, are, can you wear contact lenses after your cataract surgery? Uh, yes, you can wear contact lenses after cataract surgery. So there are certain situations where someone would still want to wear their contact lenses. Um, if they like to do monovision and contact lenses, but they don't want to have it permanently, you know, monovision um, in their lens implants, then that's a nice option that they can, you know, just wear one contact um, if they, you know, if there's an occasion they want to do monovision. Um, and, and some people um, wear contact lenses for um, certain conditions like keratoconus, um, which cannot fully be corrected with cataract surgery. Um, so, but yes, after your eye has healed, um, we usually want your eye to be completely healed and stable before you restart your contact lenses, but it can definitely be used afterwards. This next question sounds like it could be from a colleague in the medical field, but they ask, uh, do you prefer a toric IOL for pre-op astigmatism or to address the astigmatism post-op with a corneal procedure? I'll start, but I think I'll ask Dr. Camiar to weigh in a little. But I think if you have a significant amount of astigmatism and it's corneal and it's what we call regular astigmatism, um, I think the preference would be to, to consider a toric IOL because it's one procedure. It corrects both the cataract part of it and the astigmatism. But there are conditions where you have astigmatism that is not regular. And, and I can let Dr. Kamiar speak to that, but then you really wouldn't want a toric, I don't believe. Yes, so irregular astigmatism, I think is um, much more challenging to correct with a toric lens. Um, and if there was a condition of the cornea that was giving irregular astigmatism, usually we like to address it, if it can be addressed before the cataract surgery is done. Um, th there is um, also an option that incisions can be made in the cornea um, to help with astigmatism. That can be either done by hand or with the laser. Um, but in the studies that I have seen, the astigmatism correction with those incisions are much less predictable um, and sometimes a little bit unstable over the years. Um, and so my preference, if there's regular astigmatism, is to always choose the toric lens. Do the complications from cataract surgery increase substantially with age, especially after 90? And a second part is, what are the most common age-related complications? Uh, I would say that... Um... The answer to the first part, do they increase substantially with age, especially with 90? Probably not substantially, but there, I'm sure there is some increase in risk as you get older. Your tissues are not as robust. You know, you may have other, um, other conditions that may affect the, the success of the cataract surgery. Um, but we definitely do very successful, consistently successful surgery on people in their 90s. 
you know, I think identifying the potential risks ahead of time goes a long way to, to you know, setting expectations or even deciding whether or not to, to go ahead with surgery in that age group. How does dry eye disease complicate cataract surgery? So dry eyes um, can be exacerbated with cataract surgery. Um, so if you, you know, have some underlying dryness before um, the surgery, uh, afterwards, it's really common to have a persistent um, foreign body sensation or burning or you know, the eyes feel like really irritated or scratchy. Um, and it usually can last for a while, you know, a month or two after the surgery. Um, the other thing that dry eyes does is it affects the clarity of the vision. So even if someone's not so symptomatic from the um, feeling of the eye, um, it can cause this intermittent blurry vision afterwards where, um, you know, again, someone says, I have to blink my eyes a few times to see clearly. That seems to be more of an issue with the multifocal lenses. Um, so I think it's really important to try to manage the dry eyes as best as we can before the cataract surgery. And those patients usually do really well after the cataract surgery. You know, they'll usually have to continue the dry eye treatments using artificial tears and warm compresses. Um, but um, usually with that, um, people have a very successful result. After IOL, will my glass pre glasses prescription be the same forever? Sure, I'll, I'll answer that. It's um, yes and no. <laughs> so once you've had cataract surgery, the prescription that you're left with after cataract surgery, let's say a month or so after it's healed, is pretty much what you'll have for the rest of your life. But will your prescription be exactly the same forever? No, it will shift as you age just because your tissues will change shape slightly but it won't be a large shift typically for most people. It will just be small changes in their, in their prescription as they, as the years go on. Is it possible for an IOL to become displaced? Uh, yes. It, and, and, uh, that's again, a very rare situation though. Um, things that, that can cause the lens implant to be displaced. Usually it's trauma. Um, so some type of injury, and I have seen it from someone rubbing their eyes really hard, um, that can actually cause the lens to be displaced over time. Um, there are certain conditions of the eye. Um, there's one condition that's called pseudo exfoliation, that some people are born with that condition. Usually your doctor would tell you if you had this condition, um, but that does predispose someone to have a displaced lens implant also. Um, so all of these situ situations are pretty rare, but if you did have a displaced lens implant, it's usually correctable. Um, now we're able to fixate the lens in the sclera, which is the white part of the eye. And so even with a displaced lens, people can still have a very you know, good visual result. Um, they would need another surgery to, to change out those lens implants, but it, it definitely can give you a good result. Is cataract surgery recommended when there is a patient with age-related macular degeneration, even if the AMD is stable? Yes. In, in the situation where your ophthalmologist deems that the cataract is of a sufficient density that, that it, it's impacting your vision, you know, just because you have macular degeneration, regardless of type and really regardless of whether it's progressing or not, it may, may be very beneficial to have your cataract out. In other words, you have two conditions, one of which you may or may not, the macular degener degeneration, you may or may not have much that you can do about it. But if you have a cataract, it's another thing that's affecting your vision that you can just have it removed and your eye will do what it can do. But it may see substantially better, even if it's limited to what you know, the amount that the macular degeneration is affecting, it still may be better than it was prior to cataract surgery. We had a two-parter, and I think we might have skipped the second part, which was um, what are some of the age-related complications with cataract surgery? I know, Dr. Finkelstein, you mentioned doing surgery on people well into their 90s, but uh, if there are age-related complications, what are they? 
So one of the complications that can sometimes come up is the capsule that contains the lens implant is, is pretty fragile. And if it, um, it tears during um, cataract removal, um, which happens more often with the dense lenses, the lens can actually fall to the back of the eye which, and that would require a second surgery. Um, so I would say, you know, with a, a very dense lens, which would sometimes, you know, be the case with someone in their 90s having cataract surgery, there's a slightly higher risk of that happening um, during the cataract surgery, but, but it's a pretty rare complication. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are some questions that we're not going to be able to get to today, but uh, as I mentioned previously, we will um, we'll answer those by email. So if you if you emailed me a question or if you submitted one here that we didn't address, um, we will try to get back to you in a, in a timely fashion. Um, but I think for the last question, maybe we can look towards the future a little bit. Um, the question here is, what are future improvements to cataract surgery that we can look forward to? Well, we're hoping someday to have a, an implant that actually does truly focus. You know, the implants that Dr. Kamyar discussed, all, all of them are, are kind of a workaround to help us see at more than one distance. But there are some, um, there is certainly re lots of research going on to try and develop a, a lens that actually changes shape with you. Um, trying to focus, it will actually change the shape in your eye and allow you to focus, which would be truly, you know, like the holy grail for cataract surgery, which allow you to, to have vision the same way you had vision, you know, when, in your 20s and 30s. I think that there'll probably be more improvements in the laser device used for cataract surgery to make it more efficient and um, you know, make, you know, we're looking for something that gives a safer outcome. And, um, you know, uh, I think also, um, you know, something that doesn't, you know, cause, you know, any additional inflammation or swelling in the cornea. So I think there's a lot um, that can be done with the laser um, in the future. Well, thank you both again for a, a wonderful and informative presentation and, and thanks to, to the audience as well for submitting so many great questions and helping make this as informative as possible. Um, again, we will get to the emails that we weren't able to answer live during the program here and we'll get back to you via email. Um, thanks again for coming. Please keep an eye out for invitations for future webinars and we hope to see you again. Have a great day.